these? I don't need them all. No, thank you. Good morning. All right, we've got a few announcements and uh, some additions to the uh, announcements. First of all, uh, January 29th, there'll be a skating party at the Lind Arena. See the flyer that's circulating with that information. January 30th, potluck, that is with uh, health permitting. February 12th, Ladies' Day at Pickerington. <clears throat> Please RSVP by January the 28th. Information for that is posted in the back. February 20th, guest preacher from West Virginia School of Preaching. His name's Jordan Smith. CYC is going to be February 25th to 27th. So everyone knows evening services have been canceled as a precaution for the uh, impending snowstorm that's approaching. <clears throat> Patty McAvoy, please keep her in your prayers. Her grandmother, Gloria, passed away. Um, keep the hills in your prayers. They were here but had to leave due to illness. Also, there will be a get-together at the Pittmans on Friday, February the 4th, 7 o'clock. Everyone is welcome to attend.
Mike uh, announced that this was Lonnie's idea, first of all. But uh, this is the initial uh, kickoff of something that they're uh, testing the waters for to possibly do on a monthly basis. Okay, today... Our op opening prayer was going to be Mike Durst, Dorst. I'll go ahead and do that. I don't see Mike here. Um, Lord's Table, Mike Pittman is going to do that for us. Jeremiah McKenzie is leading uh, songs. Scott's doing the preaching. And Dave Neal will be doing our closing prayer. So with that, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the strength to not fear or fret. We thank you for providing a path we can be confident in. We thank you for loving us so much you sent your son to die for us. Please watch over each and every one of us, paying extra attention to the sick and those suffering. I'd like uh, everyone to keep Jim large in your prayers as well. And this is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. I ask that you please sing with me number 50, Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that rich a wretch like me. tested positive for COVID a couple weeks ago, and now we got to have a negative test before we go. So I would ask you to keep us in our prayers. We're counting on going. Um, but, yeah, I talked, <coughs> talked 
talked in the Bible class this morning a little bit. It was a funeral over the weekend. And one of the things that one of the preachers said that really hit home with me, that grief is the cost of love. And it's worth it a million times over. And I, I picture, how are you going to tie that into Christ down on the cross? Well, you know, Christ died there, I believe at least partially and partly at grief because of his love for me. When they went to Pilate, when Nicodemus went to Pilate and requested the body of Christ, Pilate was surprised that Christ was already dead. Jesus had already died on the cross prematurely. Didn't expect him to be dead. Pilate knew what he had been through. And he went and requested the body, and, and Pilate, you know, he, he's, he's, and I'm paraphrasing loosely, he's dead already? That's, that's not normal. The other, they didn't expect that. Why did Christ die so early in that process? He willingly died carrying my sins, the weight of my sins, the, the, the evil of my sins, that weight on him, I believe, contributed to him dying sooner than what they expected. They had to break the legs of the other, of the other people on the cross, and so they couldn't stand up anymore to get their breath, so they would die before the Sabbath day. Christ was already dead. Was his beatings worse than the other people's beatings? I don't think so. Pilate knew what he'd been through. Pilate was there. Pilate was aware of, of what Christ had suffered before the death. So what made the difference? The load of my sins and your sins. He couldn't talk. He couldn't handle that. He was as strong as any human being, but he was mentally and emotionally wiped out from carrying the load of my sins. That love, that was the price of the love that he had for me. And he considered it very much worthwhile to have that. Please bow with me. John, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to be here and to, to worship you and study your word. We're especially mindful of looking back at the sacrifice Christ made there on the cross that, uh, and just ask you to bless his bread representing his body. Be with us as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. bow with me again. John Father, we come before you again asking your blessing upon this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that your son shed and help us to look back in the mind's eye and I really truly try to understand that sacrifice. We ask you to bless it and ask you to bless us as we partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. The contribution has been moved into the uh, sound booth. If you haven't had the opportunity to um, contribute this morning, that is another act of worship that we do participate in. Uh, please bow with me as we pray for that. John, Father, we come before you and we ask you to bless, those as, as bless us as we contribute and bless us as we do your work here and, and, and help us to use your know, finances wisely and, and efficiently, that we may do your work, that others may accept you as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we'll sing number four. We praise thee, O God. <clears throat> 
We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Son of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and God Please stand with me as we sing number 40. Come, let us all unite to sing. <clears throat> Our help, our hope, our 
strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. Our God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. Please be seated. I got to, I think, tell a few of you, but if not, and as I t do tend to say it uh, most times that we gather here in person, that I'm thankful to be here, that I'm thankful that you are here, uh, of, and of realizing what we've had to go through, obviously, uh, for a time, but of uh, last week uh, of sickness and not being able to meet, whether in the morning or evening at all, um, of those... Uh, that are meeting with us by the live stream. We're thankful for that. Uh, but of also that, again, it was made mention due to the weather, uh, which kind of goes back to the team class this morning, what things are out of our control, such as snow. Uh, but that we are able to gather here, that we are healthy, that uh, of knowing that Dave and Chris were gone last week, that Lord willing, Mike and Lonnie will be healthy enough that they'll be gone. Uh, and we like you here, but we hope you're gone next week. Uh, and so, uh, uh, it's good, it's good that we're gathered here together, it's good that we're able to worship collectively, we're able to sing, and I hope, last week as you met in your homes, I hope that you studied God's word, I hope you're able to take some time to sing, and uh, again, since we won't be meeting here this evening, hopefully you'll make some time for that this evening in your own homes. But what we want to talk about, one of the things, hopefully for this year, 2022, one of the things I wrote down as far as topics, things to cover, uh, so we learn more about and understand better, is the church. And, and that uh, we may have talked about lessons concerning Christians and understanding that Christians are saved people and they are the church. But this should have a better understanding, looking at passages and to have that deeper understanding. So last year we had a few lessons talking about I am statements and not the I am statements of Jesus. But yeah, we talked about I am statements concerning Christians and how I am as a Christian an athlete. That as a Christian, I am a child of God. That I am a servant of God. We had a few different lessons like that. I am a fisher of men. We had those lessons. But again, as we talk about the church, another aspect, or as a Christian, what we need to understand that is we are the bride of Christ. And so that changes that relationship. And even with the things I made mention to you about being a child of God and a servant of God. That, that's Both those things are true for us. But we think in the worldly sense, we think about how children are treated, those that are in a relationship with us, and we think about those who work for us and serve us, that we have a different kind of relationship with that individual. So it is important for us, while we've talked about those things and while those things are true, it's important for us to also understand that we as Christians, saved people, men and women, who are saved, united with Christ, who have been added to his church, we are the bride. We are the bride of Christ. And so that's going to help us as we think about our relationship with Christ, as we think about how we live our lives, and to know how Christ thinks about us, how he treats us. And so we're going to be in Ephesians 5. If you want to turn there, uh, that's where we're going to be at today discussing these things, our, our two points that we'll have today, to talk about the bride of Christ. Now as you turn there, and where we'll be at for today, I want to share with you a poem. Now this poem is meant for at an earthly marriage between a husband and wife, and this is what the husband would say to his bride, to that wife-to-be. It's entitled, Loving You Is My Privilege. It says this, I've never seen anyone more beautiful in my life. I'm so honored that you agreed to be my wife. You have the sweetest heart. That's your true beauty, and I promise, as your husband, I'll fulfill each and every duty. Respecting you, honoring you, cherishing you, loving you will all be my privilege. As we start this brand new journey, I know it won't always be a fairy tale story. 
yet I have faith. With love as an, our anchor, together we can make it to any shore. Being with you, talking, laughing, sharing dreams will all be my privilege. On this surreal day, you've made me so happy in every way. As your husband now, to put you above all else is what today I vow. You think about that, and you can see how that would be read by the husband. You can see how that would be performed at a wedding ceremony. And so perhaps you said something like that, something similar to that. Uh, if you are a, a wife here who has been married, uh, and uh, well, that's encouraging to have had heard that. And so you may have been fortunate enough for your husband to say something like that. And if not, I'll stick around after services. I'll be by the printer. Uh, and if you'd like them, I will go make a copy for them. And they can say this to you later. Maybe even in weeks now when you've forgotten. But as we think about these things, and again as we pertain them uh, as specifically written for a marriage, a wedding ceremony in this life, let's talk about, since we're going to talk about the bride of Christ and spiritually how we are united with him, Think of these things concerning the church, concerning Christ and his bride. So, the first thing. I've never seen anyone more beautiful in my life. That Christ would say that about his church. I've never seen anyone more beautiful. I've died for you. I've sacrificed my life for you. You are now, as we'll read in Ephesians 5, spotless and blameless, without wrinkle. You are what I've died for. You are what I want to present to myself. Holy and perfect. That as we read, as your husband, I'll fulfill each and every duty. I have a responsibility as your husband, and I will fulfill those things. You can trust me. It also says to res uh, respecting you, honoring you, cherishing you, loving you will all be my privilege. Now again, as the church, we think of Christ saying that to you. As a member of the church, as someone who is, uh, that's been added to the church as that bride, that Christ would say such wonderful things about you, that he cherishes you. Loving you will be his privilege, will be my honor. It, it uplifts you, it upholds you to a standard of, and again, ought to bring comfort to you of how Christ views you. Now, what is, while we read those things and those perhaps encouraging things to think about, the, those good things we like to hear, it also said in the poem, it won't always be a fairy tale story. It won't always be a fairy tale story. If you've been married for some time, you know that is the case. That's you obviously you hope for a tale, fairy tale story. You hope and you enjoy those good times. You have those those high points in marriage. But there are those times. You are two individual people, and while there are things you agree on, those things, hobbies you enjoy, there are still those things that you differ on. There are still those things you disagree on. And sometimes those can flare up. Sometimes those can cause trouble. And so when we think about that with Christ, that we are still free people, who, or we are still people who have the free will choice of to be the church, to be a servant to Christ, or to go and to live in sin. And, and if we make that choice, if we choose to leave the church behind, if we choose to go after the world, that's obviously going to create a tear. That's going to create a separation of heartache with our relationship with Christ. So it won't always be a fairy tale story. We will have struggles with that. But may we continue on. May we have endurance. May we continue to move forward. And lastly, as your husband, now to put you above all else is what today I vow. Again, when we think about it, of a husband saying that to a wife, of wow, he's saying that he's putting his wife above all else. What a sacrifice. What he's willing to do. And again, that's great. Great. That's wonderful. But let's apply it to the church. Apply it to Christ saying to his church. Above all else, I've put you as a priority. Above all else, I vow this to you. And again, we see that, we understand that with his sacrifice of what he did. That the church is able to, to be today because of Christ's sacrifice. That people are able to be a collection of saved people who are truly saved. That their sins are removed because of Christ. He put the church above his own life. He put... The church above suffering, above, above pain, as Mike was talking about earlier. Jesus truly loves, truly cherishes, respects, honors his church. And how thankful we ought to be about that. Now as you would look at Ephesians 5.32, which is at the end of our reading for today, it says, I speak concerning Christ 
and the church. So yes, he does go on and trying to get people to understand the situation. He talks about an earthly marriage. And so there are perhaps, if you are married, you like to run to these verses and uh, of where we're going to start off at. But what I want to encourage you is to remind ourselves today we are not talking about you and your wife. We're not talking about you and your husband. We're talking about Christ and his church. And again, that that means of who is who is included in the bride of Christ. What's the church? Who's included in the church? Saved people, men and women. It's not just that that in this that women are to be that again that the men are to point to these verses. Ah, we'll see. Uh, 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 there's some uneven unequality in that, but yet all of us were in sin, men or women, had chosen to live in sin, but yet we were all saved by the blood of Christ. And so we have become that bride. So as we talk about these sins, this is our first point is going to talk about submitting to Christ. That's for all members of the church. Because all of us make up that church. We're saved people gathering together. We are the church. We've been added to it. So the bride of Christ is one who submits to Christ. We're going to talk about that. Of why is it that the bride would be submissive? Why is it that the bride would listen and put her trust in Christ? Because Christ loved the church. Still loves the church. These images on the screen perhaps remind you again of that wedding day, remind you of that ceremony. But what I think is uh, oh, the picture that really stands out is on the right, there with the hearts. And it says this, I did then, I do now, I will always. Again, apply that to Christ and the church. When I was on the cross, I loved you then. You weren't around, uh, you hadn't made the choice to, to be obedient to me, but yet I loved you then. I died. I was a sacrifice for you. I love you today as you struggle. As you've made the choice and you have been added to the church, I love you now and all of the things you're dealing with. I love you now and as Christ loving his church, I will always love you. I will always want that relationship with you. I will always strive for that. Now again, as we said, uh, of we are people who have that choice to leave. We have that choice to say, well, I'm no longer going to be tied to you. I'm no longer going to put my trust in you. We do have that choice. But understand from the perspective of Christ and his church, he wants to be united with you. He loves the church. He wants to take care of the church that he died for. So again, it really it helps us with our mindset, with our attitude, understanding. So with that said then, Ephesians 5, we're going to start in verse 22 through 24. Talk about that first point of submitting to Christ. The bride of Christ is being told, is shown to us, is one that submits to Christ. It says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Again, we could sit here and we could have a whole other discussion, a whole other topic about Ephesians 5 and his examples in talking about an earthly marriage. But we, what we want to talk about is Christ and his church. That it tells us here in verses 22 through 24 that we are to submit as the church that, the church, that Christ is the head of the church. He has authority. He has the ability to rule over his church. Not only to submit, but it also uses the word that we are subject to Christ. To listen. What does he have to tell us? What does he have to say for us about how it is that we should live? How we ought to interact with one another? How we ought to interact with the world? How it is that we can be submissive to him? To honor him in worship and praise? The church is made up of men and women. And so again, it's the church that submits to Christ. Because he has the authority to rule over the church. Matthew 20, 18, verse 18 would tell us that at the end of that gospel, Jesus would say, I have all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. And then we pair that with this passage and know that he has all authority over the church. We can go all the way back to Genesis 3, 16. We know there at the beginning, God created man and, and, and woman. We understand they were there in the garden of that Eve was near the tree, she was tempted, she ate of the fruit, she gave it to Adam. And there's punishment that came. And one of the punishments that came to the woman specifically was that the woman was punished by letting her husband rule over her. When we go back to that account and we talk about 
of who God was creating for Adam. It tells that he is creating a helper comparable to him. That's what Adam needed. That's what God wanted to provide for Adam. Someone comparable, a helper comparable to him. And when he went to create Eve, he didn't create Eve from the dust, from the ground, but yet had caused Adam to sleep and took a rib from Adam. And Adam then states uh, that woman, she is now a bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman. She came from man. So uh, of understanding that uh, there was that helper who was comparable, that different relationship they had in the garden at the beginning, but yet one of the things that she would, again, be punched with, one of the things she would now have to deal with was to have her husband rule over her. And, and we can see how that led up, and even as Paul's using that example today, or as he used that example in the first century as he writes it down, that that was the expectation. That's how a marriage worked. Of, of there needing to be someone who took the lead, and there's needing someone to help uh, uh, of go in that direction. Again, that doesn't mean that they're silent. Doesn't mean that they don't offer suggestions. But the best way I can compare that to uh, is if you if you got your license uh, and you had to go to driving school. And I don't know if this has been the situation for you, but even when I took the class in high school and had to use, I believe, their vehicle. There was still only one steering wheel. There was only still one set of foot pedals of gas and brake. But you can imagine how difficult it would be to drive a vehicle if two people in the front seat had wheels, if both people had gas pedals and both had brakes. Uh, if you probably had that individual, whether that be your mother, whether that be your wife, whether that be that friend of yours in the passenger seat that just doesn't believe you're going to brake in time. Uh, whether that individual thinks that you're not going fast enough, whether it is that person thinks you need to take the, the turn sharper, whatever it may be, they would cause a lot of problems with that. Be a, a lot of, of doing that. Uh, so uh, understanding that like with that car, there is only one steering wheel. There is only one person that is in control of that vehicle. That person on the side might be able to offer that suggestion. That person does more often than not offer that suggestion of what you should do, how it is you should drive, but they don't have the wheel. They don't have the gas pedal. They don't have the brake pedal. And so understanding that when we talk again about Christ and the church, so it is with us. Christ is behind the wheel. Christ is the one who has the control of where we go, of how fast we go, or whether we need to brake, but that's not us as the church. And so again, of being able to understand that role we have, understand that relationship we have with Christ. Now, just as, a, as an example, uh, earthly, and we'll make that spiritual ex uh, application, but of one way that in our marriage of Hannah and I getting married before she was married, her family, if you, you've met Phil and, and Sherry, but their last name is Bailey. So it's known that her main name was Bailey. But upon us getting married, she, she changed her name from Bailey to Fetcher, no longer being unified and tied to that group on paper, legally, those things but yet now is tied to uh, the Fetcher family, for better or worse. Uh, uh, and Hannah will tell you, we just had this discussion, uh, but Hannah will tell you that when she met my family or has continued to meet my family, she thinks they're a little crazy, a little crazy. Uh, and so that again, that she, she broke that tie, that, that name change, and well now I'm going to tie myself to these people I'm not really sure about, I'm not sure I want to be, but that's what I've done. And so, as we think about that, we think about name change, uh, again, we think about us spiritually and the state we were in, that we were once lost in sin. We were people who were stained with sin, people who continue, continually lived in it, made those choices, but yet, at one point, we were taught, yet we learned better, yet we, we came to the knowledge of Christ and His sacrifice, His love and care for us. And so we said, we're going to leave that behind. I, don't lo I no longer want to be stained with sin, but yet I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to be united with Christ. No longer stained with sin, but spotless and blameless. And so we also changed. We left behind that old man of sin. We buried that old man of sin in the watery graves of baptism. And so we're no longer tied to that, but now we're a Christian. Now we are the church. We are the bride of Christ. The church is to be humble and obedient to Christ, trusting in Christ. Christ wants what is best for us, and there's no reason that we should not submit to him. I, I know as we talk about 
these things, and I understand that people are in different relationships and, and marriages are different. So for some people, reading these passages and talking about these things and talking about the earthly example and, and then having to put their trust in Christ, well, if, if it's hard and difficult for someone to put their trust and faith in, in someone here that they can touch and that person they, they spent so much time with, it can be a challenge. But what I want to encourage you is to continue to study God's Word so that you yourself would be able to acknowledge that you can fully put your trust in God, that you can fully put your trust in Christ. And while people may have failed you here, Christ, again, has loved you, loves you currently, and will always love you, is wanting what is best for you. May we not forget that. So that leads us into the second point then, verses 25 through 30. As we talk about the bride of Christ, we see the bride of Christ is uh, to submit herself to Christ, to be faithful, to be obedient. But we also see in this passage of how the husband, his responsibility to the wife. And we see that Christ loved his church. Loves his church. So let's read that. Verse 25 through 30. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that we might sanctify and cleanse, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He wanted to present to himself a perfect church. It would go on in the next uh, few words to say a holy church, one without blemish. That's what he wanted to provide for himself. I had to ask Hannah just so I could clarify and get the facts straight. But on our wedding day six and a half years ago, uh, we got to go as in July, we got to be outside. And so, uh, of being out there, sometimes you do have to deal with dirt, you have to deal with the problems outside. And so Hannah came outside to meet me, to show me her wedding dress, things like that. And Hannah said that she was wearing heels, that it started off okay, but the longer she stood on that soft grass, the heels started to sink into the ground. And so, before they were sinking in the ground, they were nice, pretty, shiny, those things. But as they continued to sink, well, now you're going to have to become worried about that. Or even... Worse for Hannah that as she spent time outside in the nice July weather, there were ants that were trying to get uh, into her wedding dress and having to deal with them. And so uh, and Hannah didn't fall down. She didn't have any grass stains, anything like that. But it takes that white and perfect dress. It takes that, and there starts to become blemishes. There starts to become issues. It doesn't look as nice. But of understanding Christ wanted to present himself not a, not a church, not a group of people that was stained, not a church that was filled with problems, uh, that was unholy, that was unrighteous, that was wicked, but yet one who those things had been removed. Yes, those, that's who those people were, that's their past, but yet Christ wanted to erase those things. He wanted to remove those things from them. So that on that wedding day, so that when the church and Christ are united, uh, uh, of it's a glorious thing to present that church to himself. So again, when, you, when we talk about it, when we talk about the church, I hope that you're applying this to you, that Christ wanted to make you spotless and blameless, without blemish. He wanted you to be holy. He wanted to present you as glorious to himself. You may not have that soft confidence, you may not have that understanding, but as you read over these verses, as we talk about them, understand that that's what Christ wanted for you. You, you, you think about your past, you think about those things, those choices you made, and certainly, well, I just could never be presented as glorious. I could never be presented without stain, without spot, without wrinkle. And yet that's exactly, again, why Christ died, why he was a sacrifice for us. So let's continue reading then. But that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now isn't it interesting, as we end there in our reading with verse 30, and it talks and reminds us about uh, of one loving themselves, one taking care of their own bodies, we're united with Christ, we are his body, but it says we are of his flesh and of his bones. Well, if you remember, we talked about 
Adam. We talked about in the beginning. And what's one of the things Adam talks about with Eve? That Eve was flesh of my flesh, she was bone of my bone. We see that. That's illustrated. That's shown to us in the beginning. And to know that, again, we have that relation, that we are that tied, that connected with Christ. We ought to be thankful for these things. Be able to rejoice about these things. Christ loved the church so much that he gave his life for the church. For the church to start, for the church to grow, and to be united with God, to take a group of people to truly be united with God, Christ died. Christ wanted a perfect bride, a bride whose wrongs would be forgiven, so he died for the church. We are united with Christ and one with Christ. And that, again, as we get towards the end of what we just read, Christ nourishes and cherishes us. Because we are one with him, we are loved by Christ. We can go back to the Old Testament. We can see and we're told that God had a special people, that they were God's people. They were those who were not considered God's people, that, that did not have that mentality. They were those who were living in wrong. But what we need to understand about those people, and while they have been given a command to offer sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, and to do it yearly, what the Bible teaches us is that it still was not possible, truly possible, for those people simply by the yearly sacrifices, by the blood of bulls and goats, for their sin to be removed. That Christ had to come. So when we go back and we read the Gospels and we think about what Christ did, he did die for that early church. He died for those people there who heard him, who saw him, who saw the apostles, heard the apostles. He died for those people and their sins. He's died not only for those people, but for us who now study and read his word, who now come into an understanding of what he did. He died for us moving forward. But Christ also on the cross, while those people had been faithful to what they had been given, Christ his sacrifice went back and took away their sins, removed their sins from them. That their sin was not removed by creation, the blood of bulls and goats, but by the Creator. Christ is Jesus. He is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. And God came and to fulfill His wrath, to fulfill the law of a sacrifice, He became that sacrifice. God is a just God, and sin had to be punished. He understood that. He knew that. And so it is with his own life, he dies so that people might be saved. John 3.17 says that Christ came not to condemn the world, but yet that the world through him might be saved. That was his goal. That was his intention, to save people. And saved people, as we've said and as we talked about, saved people are added to the church. We are that church. And as the church, we are the bride of Christ. What a perspective that is. How that might help us and to understand our relationship with Christ. We talked this morning in Ephesians 5, in those few verses, there were not many verses, but they were important for us to understand. That the bride of Christ submits to Christ, is obedient to Christ in all things. And we do that, and we are to be reminded that as the bride of Christ, we are loved by Christ. We are loved by Christ. What greater love uh, of having to leave heaven to come and dwell among people, to interact with us. Christ loved the church. He loves you. Do not forget that. And as I said, as we look at that image and think about Christ loved you on the cross, he loves you today, and he will always love you. Always love you. He, he loved you when you were struggling, when you were separated, when you didn't know about the church, when you weren't attending services, when you didn't know about him and his Bible, didn't make time for it. He loves you now as you're, you're trying to, to be faithful, as you're trying to be obedient to him, to serve him in all that you can do. And he will continue to love you. Do not forget that. Be thankful, be glad, rejoice about those things. So if you're here this morning, and if you are someone who is saved, you are someone who's been added to the church, you are the bride of Christ, but you have to look at your life. You have to look at the last week, the last few days, and say, I've been struggling. Uh, I've been trying to do things my own way. I haven't been submissive to Christ. I haven't been obedient to Christ. Perhaps you are in need of prayers 
asking the, the congregation, brothers and sisters, a family of people, to pray for you, to encourage you, to study God's word with you. We're happy to do that. We are a family. We are a united group of people who want the best for each other. We want people just like Christ to make it to heaven. We want people there united with him. So if you're here this morning, if we can pray for you, if we can encourage you, study God's word with you. Make that known to us this morning. If you would, come forward as a stand scene, the invitation song. Sarah left because her boy was uh, sick this morning. And also wanted to mention that Steve told us that uh, Christina, his daughter, has COVID again. And that Nancy Pettit is scheduled for surgery on her foot again uh, this Friday, next com- this coming Friday. So we'll be sure to keep those folks in your prayers, as, long as, as well as Jim Large uh, being home uh, recovering. Uh, anything else needs to be announced? Chris? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of everyone, especially on live stream, uh, services tonight will be canceled because of the, uh, the coming storm, and that would also include that there won't be a live stream tonight either. So uh, we appreciate those all the, uh, that's always on live stream, and, and uh, glad you're with us. If you will, bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you give us. We thank you for this chance to be together to study your word. We ask you to help us to understand that relationship between the husband and wife and how that is, a, is an analogy for how much that you love the church. And Father, we, we thank you so much for Jesus' sacrifice. We ask you to help us as we face the challenges of a new week that we be strong in the eyes of temptation. Please help us, Father, where we're weak. We humbly ask you to forgive us of our sins and keep us safe. Through your son's name we pray. Amen.